Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Catherine Glover. I'm a research associate here at the Climate Change Institute and an instructor for the Women, Gender, Sexuality Studies Department here at University of Maine. So this public series is inspired by and structured around the Women in Climate Change class that is now in its second year. This spring, we at WGSS have partnered with and received support from the McGillicuddy Humanity Center to offer this more widely to the UMaine community and the public. I'm gonna turn things over next to my colleague, Michael Sokolow, and he's gonna talk about related programming and provide our University of Maine land acknowledgement. Welcome everybody. It's my distinct and great pleasure to kick off the Women in Climate Change series today with Dylan O'Hara's Ecofeminism in the Urban Landscape talk. My name is Michael Sokolow and I'm the director of the McGillicuddy Humanities Center here at the University of Maine. And uh, a quick note before we begin, this event is being recorded. Uh, I just need to make sure of the fact that everybody in the audience is aware of that. Um, and now I'll begin with the University of Maine's acknowledgement of the land. The University of Maine recognizes that it is located on Marsh Island in the homeland of the Penobscot Nation, where issues of water and territorial rights and encroachment upon sacred sites are ongoing. Penobscot homeland is connected to the other Wabanaki tribal nations, the Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Mi'kmaq, through kinship, alliances, and diplomacy. The university also recognizes that the Penobscot Nation and the other Wabanaki tribal nations are distinct, sovereign, legal, and political entities with their own powers of self-governance and self-determination. All right, next I'd like to mention that today's event is the first in a series and, uh, and that we have other additional events related to this year's symposium theme of climate change, telling a story of climate change, including a book reading club that's convened by Professor Cowan in Women and Gender Studies in English, and she's here with us today. Um, and that's a, a, a book series where participants will interact with Marilyn Sigmund, the author of Entangled People and Ecological Change in Alaska's Pishmak Bay. And on March 10th, we'll have a panel called The Art of Climate Change, uh, which features Maine-based climate change artists Deidre Murphy and Jill Pelto, and it'll be moderated by Laura Helmut, the executive editor of Scientific American. Information for all the events can be found at the McGillicuddy Humanities Center website, uh, or you can email us at mhc at maine.edu. And finally, I'd like to thank Professor Glover for applying for funding support from the McGillicuddy Humanity Center. And I would especially like to acknowledge the production, administrative, and promotional efforts of Karen Sieber, the humanity specialist at the McGillicuddy Humanity Center, who makes these events both possible and successful. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Katie. All right, thank you, Michael. And thanks also to Karen and Laura who are here today for providing all of their support in setting this up. So I'm thrilled to have Dylan O'Hara kick off the speaking series today. Dylan is a PhD student in the history department here at the University of Maine. Her research focuses on urban development in the mid 20th century United States and leftist activist movements. Her lecture today on ecofeminism and the urban landscape will focus on the social and political power dynamics of urban renewal in the 1960s. And Dylan is an alum of the Women in Climate Change class I'll mention as well. So we're so excited that she's here to speak today. And Dylan, when you're ready, I'll pass it to you and get your slides ready to share here. I'm ready whenever you are. All right. Hi, all. I'm really happy and flattered to be here. And I did also want to say a quick thank you to Dr. Glover, the WGS Department, and the McGillicuddy Humanity Center for setting up this series. I'm really thankful for this opportunity to be able to talk about the urban landscape. It's fitting that we start this talk today with the humane land acknowledgement particularly because today's talk has so much to do with the power politics of land ownership in the 20th century United States. As you all know, the title of my talk today is Ecofeminism in the Urban Landscape. My research primarily focuses on urban renewal in the 20th century and community resistances to those projects. As a historian, 
some of the ways I encounter and use ecofeminism is a little bit different than in other academic fields. And primarily historical research is grounded in the archives. So finding or interpreting ecofeminism often involves thinking about the past in new ways. Today, I'm gonna to take you through what it looks like when historians consider archival material through a new lens. So I'm gonna focus on a couple of themes including how ecofeminism has shaped my own work on urban renewal and where I have found ecofeminist theory in the study of American cities. I think that this photo is a fitting place to start when we think about the history of protest in American cities and the history of protest against segregation. And I'd just like to quickly draw your attention to the fact um, that the three black men who are meant to be the subject of this photo, right, are clearly captured by the photographer. Their faces are shown, the words on their signs are clearly shown, um, but the female protester who is in the foreground of this photo is turned away from us. We can't see her face and we can't see what her protest sign says. And I think it's an interesting thing to keep in mind as we think about uncovering women in the archives that we encounter specific issues when we take on that project. So as we move to the next slide, thank you. I'd like to lay out the structure for today's talk a little bit. First, I'm gonna explain how my research on segregated cities has opened up opportunities to use ecofeminism as a critical framework. In my research, urban renewal, which I will explain in detail in a little bit, is an example of how to consider the ways that social hierarchy affected the environment of the past. I will be using ecofeminism in that example to focus specifically on racial difference and racial bias as historical factors that are reflected in the environment. My archival examples will be from research I've done in San Antonio, Texas. Second, I will talk a little bit about the history of women as urban theorists and as early ecofeminists. Through the theories of activists like Jane Jacobs, historians can see how women urbanites in the United States reconceptualize the possibilities for ordered environments and community governance. That section will emphasize Jane Jacobs' activism in New York City and her responses to urban renewal. I will directly engage with Jacobs' ideas about cities as ecofeminist solutions to problems in the 20th century. And finally, just to wrap up, we'll consider how historical examinations of inequity in the urban landscape shapes debates we have today about climate change and environmental racism. So you'll notice that my archival examples are split between Texas and the Northeast. This is also evidence of how my own education has influenced the way that I study urban history, which started with my master's work at the University of Texas in San Antonio, and then continued here at the University of Maine. So you'll be able to see that transformation across the arc of the work in the presentation today. So if we move to the next slide, thank you so much. We're gonna talk a little bit about ecofeminism and why it matters for historians. Ecofeminism prioritizes a gendered approach to understanding how humans interact with the environment. The emphasis on social hierarchy in feminist approaches can encourage historians to look at how power differences manifest in land management. Ecofeminism can be usefully combined with other kinds of historical approaches that prioritize marginalized populations, silenced historical actors, or historical subjects who have been routinely stripped of traditional power. So social history and cultural history hold the expanded possibility for infusing issues of the environment into how historians conceptualize inequality. A combined approach can work on two levels. Right, so the environment reflects social hierarchy and social hierarchies can affect the environment. Of course, the act of writing history or doing this kind of historical research or giving a lecture can also be an act of ecofeminism. 
So in looking at the neighborhood picture to the right on Wyoming Street in San Antonio, Texas, we can see a community that's been the subject of some of my early research. This was a multi-ethnic but majority Mexican-American neighborhood that stood near the city's downtown river district. Beginning in 1964, city managers started to scope out the neighborhood for possible demolition under an urban renewal project that would clear that area so that San Antonio could host the 1968 World's Fair in that spot. As we'll see, the power dynamics of urban renewal did not favor community members themselves. These power dynamics came to shape the landscape and the landscape came to reflect the city government's discrimination. So we'll move on to our next slide here. Thank you. As an introduction to urban renewal, we can think about the specific kind of building project. Urban renewal in the United States is a name for just a specific type of building project that became popular in the post-World War II period. The main objective was to get rid of blighted neighborhoods and rejuvenate American cities, which were at that point considered to be run down after the Great Depression. Using newly available federal funds for urban renewal during the New Deal, city planners and city governments often tore down tenement housing or built or relocated apartments. They tore down un unoccupied businesses to make parks and very famously built bridges and freeways. One of the most infamously controversial decisions made by city planners and various levels of government in this period was to use urban renewal funds to tear down blighted neighborhoods or what were then called slums, right? Which I'm using in quotes on purpose. Urban renewal since this time has retained its violent reputation because of the use of federal funds to tear down still habitable neighborhoods, relocate residents without informing them of demolition dates and in order to put in parks, museums, art districts, and business districts. Of course, as we should know, it's no accident that the overwhelming majority of neighborhoods removed during the urban renewal period were communities of color. The power dynamics of urban renewal can be a fruitful place to consider the possibilities of ecofeminist history. So urban renewal can be a crossroads between ideas of urban land use the operative structure of white supremacy or what we can, would consider a racialized approach and community liberation. So this photo, for example, shows the removal of the previously pictured neighborhood after demolition. The success of demolition shows the power of white city managers in making these kinds of decisions, but other voices across the city dissented. The San Antonio Office of La Prensa, the popular Spanish language newspaper in the American Southwest, had long lamented the negative effects of over-policing since at least the mid-1930s in the city. And they often noted in their opinion columns that processes of urbanization often unfairly removed their communities. Mexican-American critique of unequal urbanization in San Antonio remains one of the most important touchstones for the history of the urban landscape in that city. Okay, so if we look at the next slide, thank you. We're gonna think a little bit thematically about urban landscapes as environments. And despite cultural perceptions of cities as man-made spaces, Hyperdevelopment does not separate urbanity from the environment. Many climate scientists, for example, in the last five years especially, have noted that some of the most at-risk places across the globe are highly populated cities on shorelines, for example. In conjunction with considering climate change in the present, it can be enlightening to consider cities as environments in the historical view as well. The approach for me has helped reveal how city planners in the past designed cities. So which environmental factors they were responding to and which ones they ignored. This can also reveal how community residents understood their neighborhoods, 
how cities were often sites of power struggles for resources and community governance. San Antonio, for example, is a city on a river. And as you can see on this slide, the photo of a flooded Travis Street in 1913 is a good example of a city in an environment because of how obvious it is that the city isn't managing the landscape in this specific instance. This picture was taken about 40 years before San Antonio installed its extensive levee system. More recently, however, levees have been less affected less effective at mitigating floods due to irregular rain and tropical storms intensified by climate change. In terms of urban renewal, building projects like freeways, overpasses, strip malls, and fairgrounds, of course, like the one I've been referencing, are perfect receptacles for flash floods. Today, the world's fairground in San Antonio is at eminent heightened risk of flash floods, pooling in the plaza's parking lots and walkways. So while urban renewal and gentrification served the monetary and symbolic goals of city planners, it did not serve ecological longevity. Eco-feminist frameworks ask us to acknowledge that unequal power over the land also puts it at risk of destruction. The tenets of ecofeminism use this kind of stratified social approach to look at these issues reflected in the management of the landscape. Another way that ecofeminism shapes my work, especially is through thinking about resource management. Cities can be collecting centers of resources and they are usually always sites where natural resources are at least in attempt places where they try to redistribute resources among populations like water, electricity, gas, food, and waste. One way to find connections between the environment and social history is through the conflicts surrounding equal access to resources. In modern cities, like in our modern cultural consciousness, this manifests through examples like contaminated water in Flint, Michigan, which is still an ongoing issue and as we know, primarily affects black neighborhoods in Flint. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So when we talk about the connections between the environment, social history and cities, environmental racism very obviously comes to the fore as a powerful theme. In our modern understandings of the term, we have come to incorporate critiques of food deserts, unequal access to resources, and the particular dangers that low income and marginalized communities face in the age of climate change. An ecofeminist view of the past can also help us see the longer roots of those structural issues. In fact, discriminatory demolition usually has generational effects. As you can see in the image here, land surveyors took pictures of the community businesses and homes that they had slated for demolition in preparation for the World's Fair project. Even though city planners reasoned through their decision to demolish the neighborhood by saying it was unsalvageable blight in the photo, go back a slide, thank you. In the photo here, you can see that the business is a center of community life, right? There are patrons parked outside. Kinky and Nando's, which is the name of the diner picture here, was reported by residents to have been a community gathering point. But in the decades following community removal and the destruction of local business, affordable community stores and restaurants could no longer serve their neighbors. So these important community gathering places are removed. Okay, next slide, thank you. So these issues, struggles and responses all set the stage for a new generation of activists in the late 1960s who vehemently opposed segregation, urban renewal and environmental destruction of cities. These are the actors that we might think of as early eco-theorists. Notably, women entered the scene as early eco-theorists and as eco-feminists. Their ground up visions for community empowerment and liberation embodied some of the ideas that later ecofeminists would pick up on in some of their critical work. 
Responding to a period of intense urban segregation, ecofeminism offered a way that activists could propose other kinds of environmental solutions. So in the following section, we'll consider the importance of one of those theorists and her visions for community liberation. Jane Jacobs, as you can see here, the protesters have signs with her name on it. Jane Jacobs is one of the most well-known anti-renewal activists of the 20th century, particularly known for her work in New York. Her emphasis on community liberation and a people's approach to urban planning are some of her strongest legacies. The height of Jacobs' fame came when she opposed the infamous, the now infamous, of course, Robert Moses, who proposed a highway that would cut through Greenwich Village called the Lower Manhattan Expressway or Lomex. Lomex's proposed construction, as by now should be a little bit unsurprising to us, hinged on the destruction of what Moses called quote unquote cancerous slums, which were predominantly populated by black and brown New Yorkers. Jacob's eventual success in defeating the Lomex project in 1966 was the starkest incident of community preservation in the face of what were by then becoming popularly known as kind of evil city planners. So it was becoming more popular to protest against these kind of building projects. In this photograph, you can see community members protesting the arrest of Jane Jacobs, who was at that point held in jail on charges of inciting a riot. Her organized protest against Lomex spread rapidly across the East Village, incorporating the participation of families, as you can see here. So there are women and children participating in this kind of protest. Notably, Jacob's ideas about alternate visions of what cities could be helped her gain popular support. For Jacobs and those who came to follow her, the city was not a space to be ordered in the same way that it was for urban planners. A city was a place of spontaneous multiplicity. The organic or spontaneous city to Jane Jacobs did not require the modernization of freeways or of urban renewal. New urbanists had envisioned the preservation of historic city buildings, pre-existing ethnic diversity and renewal projects that kept communities and established neighborhoods already intact. So if this trend of renewal, this cultural trend of renewal was truly to live up to what its name said it was, the replacement housing or new community infrastructure should house and serve the constituents who were already living in the proposed project area. For Jacobs and the new urbanists, modernization was based on community uplift, structural equality, and unique neighborhood character. Themselves involved in the preservation of history and equality, the new urbanists tried to unite across racial and socioeconomic divisions and focus on their identities as urbanites in shared, in shared environments. So they sought to bridge these ideological and personal gaps between themselves and people that might be their allies through their use of their conception of the environment. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Other than the human tolls of Lomex, Jacobs and the new urbanists often worried about environmental concerns of things like expressways. Dead space under freeways have the propensity for floodwaters to collect, exacerbate noise pollution, sound pollution, light pollution, as well as the disruption of bird populations. For new urbanists, ecological devastation could be mitigated by community governance, that community members themselves held the key to knowledge about how to best design the future of cities. 
Community preservation, liberation, and anti-racism was directly tied to grassroots efforts that could mitigate ecological damage to cityscapes. So the follow-up question kind of becomes, how did the new urbanists envision the solution to these problems? Right, and there are several. So this issue of perceived urban blight or actual urban blight and issues of deep economic and racial segregation. Beyond simply stopping urban renewal projects, eco-theorists and eco-feminists like Jane Jacobs had other ideas about how existing communities could order the urban environment in liberatory ways. Jane Jacobs' ideas for the theoretical possibilities of sidewalks, for example, hinges on the use of common public space as a way to break down economic and racial segregation and over-policing. We can see here in the top quote that she identifies segregation and racial discrimination as the country's most pressing issues. Right, and so the solution, sidewalk public contact and sidewalk public safety are the conduit through which public space can aid cross identity understanding. In the bottom excerpt, Jacobs references the built-in equipment of city streets to bridge the gap between the identities of different urban constituents. Jacobs, for example, thought that equal access to parks would create the kind of community environment that favored bridges across differences in identity. To her, the environment and the reorganization of social space could be a solution to damaging social hierarchy. In her romantic vision, the rich and the poor, white, black, and brown Americans of all ages would be able to build coalitions in, in shared spaces like parks. Right? So the differences right, the room for great differences among neighbors are aided by this urban equipment or this urban space in which coalitions between people could be built. Okay, next slide, please. So bringing the example full circle Jacobs also joined the chorus of activists around the country who condemned the unfairness of urban renewal projects and their knack for perpetuating urban inequality. As can be seen in this excerpt, she directly connects motivation for urban renewal to the monetary gains of city managers rather than the best interests of everyday people. So you can see in the middle of this section right here from Yorkville in New York, an estimated 15,000 families have been driven out between 1951 and 1960 by this means. Virtually all of them left unwillingly. And so in Jacob's work, which is titled The Death and Life of Great American Cities, she popularized some of the new urbanist thoughts, which were hoping to deconstruct a larger government belief in the fact that urban renewal would revitalize cityscapes and fix the issues of economic inequality, which plagued most American cities, particularly in the post-World War II period. Altogether, we can see across this presentation that profound changes were happening in the way that people in the 1960s argued over the ordering of the natural and urban environment. So city planners favored a vision of the ordering of the environment, which relied on urban renewal as an easy fix, as an aesthetic fix, and as a fix that was focused on appearances as a way to achieve the intended result. 
most notably of, as we've seen across this presentation, counter movements to urban renewal can also hold the key to understanding the critique of long-term detrimental effects of urbanization. Ecofeminism can help us tease out the intricacies of how gendered racial and economic power inequality affected the motivations to change urban environments and in how community members propose solutions to those problems. Of course, ecofeminist tenets of study might also invite us to be critical of Jane Jacobs' position as a white woman and some of her rosy visions of sidewalks as functional solutions to white supremacy and especially her emphasis on urban identity superseding racial identity. She is reflected of a social movement in time in which people were trying to think about the reordering of the urban environment. And so some of her ideas about the identity of city members can also be a key to understanding some of the societal changes that she was specifically responding to which was a large period of social upheavals that largely hinged on the civil rights movement, early women's movement, and the foreground for the environmental movement of the 1970s. Okay, next slide. Thank you. So, as we've mentioned at several points throughout the talk so far, urban conflicts in the past also influence how we understand inequality and environmental racism in the age of climate change. Urban renewal in the 1960s has set some of the groundwork for the current problems that we face when we talk about climate change, when we talk about ongoing urbanization, and the way that building projects affect the ordered state of urban environments. Especially when we consider things like managing floodplains, the formation of vice districts or police districts, and access to state services. Current debates about over-policing of neighborhoods of color, for instance, have direct roots in the history of segregation which allowed for the tighter formation and surveillance of vice districts. Once again, right now, contemporarily, we're in a period of time in which community solutions to structural problems emphasize community liberation and activists connects problems of the urban landscape to social inequality in our national consciousness. Current extreme weather events, like the current snowstorm actually that's happening in Texas right now, expose some of the issues of urban inequality and how they persist into the present. So things like current boil notices for city water and long wait times for the restoration of electricity that's exacerbated by Texas's privatized power grid that runs along lines of economic segregation can reveal the decades of urbanization did not solve all of the problems that manifested in Jane Jacob's work. And despite her lifetime of activism, a lot of the proposed changes that she wanted to put forth have not actually been put into effect. Climate change's ecological destruction poses particular challenges to urban environments that have longer histories than we might think in the contemporary. Understanding the historical root of those inequalities can also help us consider solutions. Looking to activists in the past can offer insight into new directions. In the age of climate change, expanded access to reliable power grids, stable infrastructure, and drainage systems for increasing floods, for example, will continue to expose the inequalities of modern urban landscapes. But the study of the past also holds opportunities for reminding us that community-based solutions can hold the, the key for creative problem solving. <clears throat> 
Ecofeminism can help us see that future solutions to the problems of racial inequality and ecological risk can go hand in hand, and that the experts who we should consult in this project are community members themselves. They hold the local ecological knowledge that is the key and the linchpin to this kind of solution. So I'm really actually happy to end this presentation by considering the issues we face in the present because utilizing ecofeminism to understand urban renewal in the past can and should be connected to modern issues. And so I'm excited to hear what you guys think about these problems and about possible solutions. And so I thank you for allowing me to share some of my research and explain some core tenets of ecofeminism in the historical record. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and for everybody going through this with me. So thank you. And thanks so much, Dylan. And thank you too for, um, I know since we talked earlier this week or last week, incorporating some of the current events that are happening in Texas with the um, snowstorms and this underserved electrical grid. We have some time now for Q&A. If folks would like to drop a question in the chat, I can moderate and ask Dylan to follow up with these questions. And Dylan, are you open to, ent open to entertaining questions about this current event that you brought up as well? Yeah, of course. I think it's interesting to think about. Well, I can go ahead and ask you, Dylan, since um, we have, you know, this year's slate of students that are actually enrolled in the Women in Climate Change class this spring here with us today. Um, I know when you took the class, you had gone down this route of ecofeminism and thinking about the urban landscape and then found Jane Jacobs work. And I just wanted to ask, you know, you've described how you do your own research and it's really embedded in this archival research as we saw from the quotes and from the photos. And did you encounter any challenges with sort of adapting the norms and the methods in your field to this new area of ecofeminism and looking at feminist approaches to history. So if you have any challenges to share with that or advice for students about to embark on their own projects, we'd love to hear it. Yeah, that's a really good question. I would say, I think that one challenge that remains is the sticky idea that when you study women's history or ecofeminism, you have to stick to a straight set of rules in which when you go into the archive, you have to find a woman. And I think as is obvious in, especially particularly in the first half of my presentation, I'm thinking about ecofeminism as like a larger theoretical structure in which like I actually have a lot of creativity to think about moments in time that I've already studied. And so in the San Antonio example, um, it's actually been really useful to go back and think about that example with a more ecological lens because it allows me to think more about the landscape in which those racial power relations took place. And despite the fact that it is difficult to find female historical actors in the past, it doesn't disqualify that work from using an ecofeminist lens. So it can be a, an advantage, but I do think sometimes it is a challenge to kind of work your way into using it. Um, especially if you feel like it's more difficult to find female actors in the past who are rooting you in something that feels specifically ecofeminist. Um, but I think that there's room for creativity there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've gotten a few more questions. I just I have to expand my chat here so I can read them all. And uh, just want to ask one from Gabby Hillier. Um, she asks, in terms of urban planning and ecofeminism, I'm curious about your thoughts around planned retreat. 
as a solution for vulnerable areas. Yeah. Um, I think it can be, I don't know. I'm less familiar about the historical implications. And so I hesitate to talk about its about its longer historical roots, but I do think it's interesting to think about the implications of the movement of people across space, like especially in the age of climate change, like what are the ethics of moving people from place to place? Um, and how do you do so in a way that incorporates community unity and you know, I think some of the issues are the same from the things that I'm talking about in urban renewal, which is that uh, keeping a community unit intact is one of the things that's the most important. And I think that it would be interesting to consider, I'm not super qualified to talk about the retreats, but I think one aspect of it that can be interesting to think about is the ethics of being able to keep a community as a single unit in responding to these climate issues. Thanks, Dylan. And thanks for being frank too about like, you know, where expertise lies and where it doesn't and where we can speculate and where we can't. Um, that relates to one of the other questions I've gotten from Mo Whiteman where she asks, I read somewhere that blame has been placed by people in charge on renewable energy in Texas for the reason why many places have lost power. So how, any ideas for combating false information that is being said about green avenues? I mean, I, it's a good question. I, th I think it has to do somewhat with how we conceptualize a critique of corporations. And I mean, I always advocate for personal research and the way we can use personal research to inform <laughs> how we conceptualize our, our visions of contemporary issues. And I think that particularly with green energy and power grids being such an important linchpin for the future of urban spaces, it's going to be, it's going to become more and more important to think about the corporate structure of how those mechanisms are being put in place and by proxy, how green energy has a plan to reach top down and bottom up. A lot of the things that I was talking about, which is an issue with urban renewal is proposed solutions to problems really do need to come from the bottom up. And one thing about green power grids that I would say is important to think about is whether there's an emphasis on helping like the baseline block units of a community. So individual people, individual households, like how does the grid itself access and influence and give access to individual people and individual households? Thanks. So next up, I've gotten a question from Kate Christian who has identified as she's an environmental historian, an institutional historian at the Smithsonian. Um, and she'd like to unmute and ask her question verbally. So Kate, if you're there and able to unmute, or I can facilitate that. <laughs> Is it okay if I start my video as well? Sure. <laughs> or not doing video? You can share video. Okay, great. Um, I think I've done that, have I? Um, yeah, you have. Dylan. Um, there you are. Hi. Um, really interesting project. Um, and it's always weird when one oneself becomes part of the historical time period people are studying. <laughs> I've always studied er, recent history, so it, it's weird, particularly weird for me when that happens. I wanted to, I'd love to talk to you about this more later, but I'll leave as my particular, put, put as my particular question right now, thinking about the incredible longevity of Robert Moses' uh, career. And of course, Jane Jacobs herself had a super long career too. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I don't know when they intersected or whatever, but I used to work on the history of parks in New York and we uncovered the archives 
from 1934 to 54 that were the Moses archives. Um, and one of the things I studied was the construction of the Henry Hudson Parkway. And basically what happened there was that the structure, it was open in 36 and it went through the Northwest Bronx and it destroyed four village centers, Spite and Dival, Kingsbridge, Marble Hill, parts of Riverdale. And I was just thinking as you were talking, um, I think Moses basically, you know, and it's so, first of all, the extent of his, I don't know if megalomania is the, but megalo something. No, I mean, it's, a good, it's a good term for it. The level of his control because he was commissioner of everything for about 45 years. So that by the time Jane, Jane Jacobs got to him, like, you know, a lot of people had already been trying, but it just occurred to me in, in thinking about the Lower East Side and then thinking about the Riverdale case um, and Spite and Dival and all these places that were so destroyed that people don't remember their names anymore. Mm -hmm. What he really did originally was to sort of take away all the suburban, exurban, you know, think of Flushing Bay, all these other things. So it's like he didn't need the slum story originally. It was more the improving story and the emptiness story because, and, and sort of taking people by surprise and doing things by fiat. And then later on, as you get to the 1960s, there's, there's, and, and so I was just thinking about in the terms of, uh, which I will now forget, of um, translation of, you know, multiple categories that people are part of, really this effectively rural nature that had been part of New York where Berenice Abbott has photographs of people, you know, years before it became popular in Brooklyn, of people just raising chickens in the Bronx. Yes, wild. That was sort of what they did because that was part of their food systems. So I was just thinking about how, gosh, it was first an anti-rural thing in a way that they did and went on from that. So I was just real curious. I know that's not your specific time period, but I, I love to hear any comment you have about that. Well, I think it's a great point about <laughs> other things that I've said in this talk about longer historical roots of why city planners and why government officials were so concerned with modernizing the urban landscape. And this anti-rural sentiment is partially due to the fact that like anti-ruralism as like an elite or cosmopolitan aesthetic doctrine was well, and better, very yeah. attractive as a modernizing force like that the city you know what I mean and I think it says interesting things about implanting a aesthetics and b this issue of like new deal post-depression modernism onto right. a populace through use of the land that like new uses of the land, like also then would modernize the people who live on it. So asking people not to raise chickens or denying the space that they would use to actually raise the chickens. You know what I mean? Yeah, he would permits, I think is how they really did. But yeah, that's true. And then with Moses, I mean, I think the other thing is, cause I don't think that the, how do you call them? The city planners, the theoretical planners were all, in opposition to the things, I think I think that many of them were very sincere. But then, then that other question, and then I'll stop. Of, of to what extent did Moses just shut down the discussion because he made all the decisions? So I do not at all believe in the great man theory of history. But I also, Moses was how he collected that political power just. In, and, and it's it's not a case of exceptionalism, it's just maybe a case of exceptional concentration in one figure rather than in, you know, but still part of a particular kind of elite. And, and those poor theoretical um, city planners who ultimately other cities in other parts of the world, in Europe, for example, did get built on some of those conceptions, you know, what, what happens with that? So, sorry, that blows it all open, but I, I think your work is super interesting. And it's no, yeah, and I, 
No. Yeah. And I think it's an interesting point because Moses was definitely surrounded by a concert of like pseudo liberal city planners who were actually trying to solve issues of inequality. Um, but his, like you've said, his like fantastic concentration of power put him in such a place that the anti urban renewal activism so focused on him as a focal point of of evil or is like promoting this thing um, that distracts a lot of the attention like on his particular viewpoint about the ordering of cities and the ordering of of the urban universe or whatever so yeah I, th I think the responses to him also reflect in the record how anti-urban activists have responded to the concentration of power in him as a person and also in the ideology he was like very very committed to yeah yeah uh, where how does equity come out of this it's a, it's tough it's tough <laughs> yeah it is tough and there's not one answer so well thank you yeah thank you yeah thank you for that question and those thoughts. Um, sticking with this idea of historical figures, I'd like to pick the next question, which is from Sierra Ramirez. Um, and Dylan, she expressed, thank you for such an informative lecture. While understanding limitations inherent in archival research, has your research uncovered figures similar to Jane Jacobs in the San Antonio, South Central Texas area? That's such a good question. Hi, Sierra. I'm very glad you're here. Sierra is an indigenous historian of environmental histories. She's an old classmate of mine and I'm very glad she's here. And so thank you for your question. Um, short answer, yes. And part of the reason that Jane Jacobs is so intimately a part of this presentation is because of the ridiculous amount of attention she received in the media and how popular she is as a lasting figure of new urbanism, which I think also reflects other things about her, like what an elite educated person she was and the fact that she was also working in New York, which like sucks our historical attention in that direction. Um, in the Southwest though, eco activists particularly centered on the Brown Power Movement, also like defined a lot of the ways in which activists thought about the San Antonio area, particularly like Cesar Chavez, it attracts our attention, A, because he was such an important and well-known activist, but he was also engaging directly with how people in the Southwest, particularly like Mexican and Mexican American agricultural workers were interacting with the environment and their inter their intimate knowledge of the environment and how that informed um, how they saw paths to liberation. Um, Emma Tenayuca also organized, for those of you who are familiar with Texas history, she organized the pecan shellers strike in San Antonio. And also as a woman, as an agricultural laborer, as a woman of color, like also, embodies the history of the way that women have been intimately intertwined with a agricultural industries and ecofeminist knowledge and the language and the action of personal liberation movements. Emma Tanayuka was also a communist, which is interesting and informs like a lot of her liberatory language. Um, and she defined a lot of the eco-activism of the Southwest and how people in the Southwest thought about personal liberation through A, through labor and B, through structures of inequality. Thanks, Dylan. And thanks for joining us today, Sierra. Um, somewhat related question I'd like to ask next uh, comes from Nola Prevost. And she expressed thanks for speaking and that it's been a super interesting presentation. I'm curious about what your research on urban planning has revealed for indigenous communities and issues around reservation lands, not only where those reservations were chosen to be in the past, but access to resources since then. Yeah, I think the study of cities brings these issues really accurately to the fore because 
A lot of urban historians don't necessarily focus on indigenous people in urban landscapes, partially because of historiographical stereotyping of indigenous people is like not part of urban landscapes, but rather more intertwined with rural landscapes. Um, there's a lot of interesting work being done on urban indigenous activism, which I am less versed in. Um, but it's interesting to consider as we talk about the politics of land ownership in cities, how indigenous activists are expressing their ownership over the land in urban environments where lots of people are making claims about their ownership of the land. And particularly like in thinking about like indigenous urban actors, I think it opens up really, really fruitful ways to consider um, the inequality of the urban landscape. And I wish that I had a work to suggest to you. I have one that I'm thinking of, but I can't remember the name and I can send it to you <laughs> when I remember afterwards, but. Yeah, I'm happy to facilitate if you wanna pass anything on to me afterwards or if folks want to reach out for Dylan's contact information, I'm happy to facilitate that. And I'll ask our last question in the chat before we close out today. And that came from Laura Cowan. And she asks, so earlier activists were using the principles and tenets implicit in ecofeminism. These come from ecology and from Rachel Carson. Mm -hmm. Were they more aware of themselves as feminists or as ecologists? Yeah, that's a good question. It's tough reading ecology and feminism kind of backwards onto the past. And there's a lot of criticism, I think, about whether or not you can read feminism backwards or read um, environmentalism backwards if the historical people themselves haven't considered themselves in such terms. Um, I do think, for instance, in the example of Jane Jacobs, I do think that she considered herself a feminist, certainly. I, it's not my contention that she sees herself necessarily as an ecologist. I think she thinks of herself um, as an urban theorist. But some of my arguments are asking us a little bit more concertedly to think about like whether urban theorists could also be considered ecologists. And so while she wouldn't necessarily characterize herself that way, I think some of her questions about flooding and pollution especially do indicate that she like was thinking in an ecological way or was responding to things that might indicate that ecology like was something that she was like tossing around in some way that was like interacting with how she built her, her interpretive framework. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's interesting, particularly like in this lead up to the 1970s, the pre environmental movement period where people are responding to issues of the environment, but may not necessarily use the language of environmentalism to describe themselves. Thanks, Dylan. Um, and just catching up with the chat here, we've had a few more comments from participants. Uh, Jerry Gross mentions that a good fictional read about contemporary urban, urban Native Americans is Tommy Orange is there there. She sends her thanks for an important discussion and thanks for joining us today, Jerry. Um, and then from Mo, just the interesting juxtaposition between urban not really being outwardly ecological, though it's through man-made construction of ecology. That said, it's three o'clock right now. We're at the top of the hour. I wanna thank everyone again for tuning in today. Dylan, thanks so much for your work and for the talk you've given us today. And just a reminder, we have four more um, webinars in the series on Select Thursdays. If you've registered for this event, you should be able to opt in to the remaining ones. And thanks again for coming and have a great Thursday.